Welcome back. So we're talking about neural networks, which is a very powerful, expressive machine learning architecture to learn arbitrary input-output functions, given that you have enough training data. So now I want to walk through a little bit of the architecture and kind of how you build neural networks, what they're made of, things like that. So the basic building block of a neural network is a neuron, which is this little uh, functional unit, kind of an input-output uh, node or neuron. And to be mathematically precise, you have kind of an input signal, U, that goes into this node, and it does some mathematical operation on U to give you some output, Y. And this could be something like just multiplying it by a constant or adding a constant, uh, or it could be more, more sophisticated. So often, people use sigmoidal functions. Uh, these are called activation functions, where if u is small, the output is just 0. And if u is large, regardless of how large it is, the output might be 1. And then there's some smooth uh, activation function from 0 to 1. This is a sigmoidal uh, or a hyperbolic tangent activation function. Very, very common. Uh, also neural inspired. So a lot of the neurons uh, in your brain kind of have these sigmoidal activation functions. So this is really, really commonly used. Uh, increasingly now people use this kind of, uh, this rel u um, linear kind of, uh, it's, it's zero up until a point and then it grows linearly with u. Uh, this is a very useful, useful building block that people are using in, in modern machine learning architecture. And I could give a whole lecture on all of these different activation functions. Uh, there's tons of them. Some are better for some things, some are better for others. Uh, the rel u is very common, so is the sigmoidal. So you take that, that neuron, that unit, and you start to stack it uh, either in series or in parallel or both. So I can put two neurons next to each other and do a more complicated function, this function, uh, this function followed by this function. I can have middle layers. I can, for example, do three uh, different functions from this output. And then I can add all of those up or multiply them or do some other function. Um, downstream. And so I can build up this kind of complexity in what's known as an artificial neural network. So here uh, I've built up this neural network. It's a network uh, with nodes and edges describing the topology of how it's connected, uh, but it's artificial. So neural networks, you know, you have neural networks in, in your head. This is an artificial one uh, built up out of these building blocks. And the different nodes can have different activation functions. Um, you, they can add up linear combinations of, of their, uh, the previous layer and things like that. Okay? And then if you keep stacking more and more and more of these layers, so each layer uh, is doing some kind of sequential processing, if you start to add a lot of these, then you have what's known as a deep neural network. And this is the basis of deep learning uh, today. Okay, and so there are a ton of things you can do with these neural network architectures. I'm just going to show you a few here. Uh, so this is this is kind of the neural network zoo. My colleague Nathan Kutz uh, made this image. It was inspired by the Asimov Institute's neural network zoo. Uh, this is in our textbook, Data Driven Science and Engineering, and this just gives you an idea of some of the the massive variety of neural network architectures that you can design. And so each color for the different nodes means different types of nodes, different types of computations that are happening. There's also the different topology of whether or not information is getting compressed in a bottleneck and expanded, or um, you know, all of these different architectures. And this is only a few of, of kind of the, the architectures out there in neural networks. So really there, there are tons of different, and every, every year there are dozens of new architectures being proposed to solve different problems. Uh, so it really is a zoo. There's a ton of a ton of different things you can do, and we're increasingly learning uh, through trial and error and study and analysis uh, and lots of hard work by many researchers which architectures are good for which problems. Um, and so again, this is just just a few of them. Um, so a couple of, of key ones I want to point out, uh, convolutional neural networks, CNNs, are really, really important. These are used a lot in image recognition. The basic idea is if I have a big uh, image, this array here, I don't know if you can see, but there's a smiley face. I took this from Wikipedia. What a convolu convolutional neural network does is it has these convolutional layers that basically take a mask and slide it across the image doing local computations 
uh, in local patches. And so what you might be able to do is pull out edges or features. And you would run that through a convolutional layer and pull out these, these edges. And then you might run those through another convolutional layer and another convolutional layer. And you stack these convolutional layers and then you do some processing on them. And so convolutional neural network CNNs are really important for image recognition. Anything where there is a translation invariant. So, you know, if I have a picture of a cat, the cat could be over here or it could be over here. CNNs can start to pull out kind of this translational invariance that exists in images. Uh, recurrent neural networks are really useful for uh, audio and temporal signals, signals that vary in time, like uh, if you looked at the, the acoustic signature of speech in time. And what these do, uh, I didn't actually draw it, but what you can do is you can add these kind of feedback loops. So you can have the neurons feeding back to themselves, or I can have different layers kind of feeding back. And so this allows you to have this kind of temporal feedback where there's some memory in the system. It's not just a feed forward network, which is what I showed you before, where all of the information just flows from left to right. Here you have this kind of feedback network, this recurrent neural network uh, that gives you this memory. So LSTMs, long short-term memory networks, are really useful for um, audio processing and dynamical systems, anything that varies in time, because they have these kind of feedback signals which allow you to, to have kind of memory. So there's, there's information that's just living here, kind of getting recirculated through this network. So that's pretty cool. Uh, very, very interesting architecture. Another one that I really like a lot, and I use a lot, is the autoencoder. So here I'm showing you kind of what I think of as a shallow linear autoencoder, meaning that my nodes are doing linear combinations, just taking linear combinations of the input layer. And what the autoencoder is trying to do is take a high dimensional signal, compress it down to some latent space, uh, this Z variable, that's all the information I need to keep track of, in a way that that Z information can be re uh, kind of lifted back to the high dimensional image so that x hat is approximately equal to x. Okay, so this is kind of a compression, decompression, or an encoder, decoder architecture where you can take big data, high dimensional data, and figure out what is the kind of the latent space, what are the degrees of freedom that matter. Uh, and so researchers showed a long time ago that you could reconstruct the famous principal component analysis, which has been around for 100 years, in this neural network architecture, this uh, shallow linear autoencoder network. And since then, researchers have massively generalized this to deep autoencoders, where now the, the nodes can have nonlinear activation functions, and I can have many, 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 many layers, and get better compression, better kind of extraction of the essential features of my, my high dimensional data in this latent space Z. And that's one of the reasons I like these models is because there's some interpretability that you get when you do this kind of information bottleneck, this compression down to this latent space, because there might be few enough variables here that I can actually analyze and try to understand what these mean uh, with respect to the data. So I think these are kind of just some neat architectures. You have convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, you have these autoencoder networks, and there's many, many more, uh, kind of as, as much as you can imagine you can build a network. Uh, to do it. And maybe that's the last thing I want to point out is that designing and implementing these architectures is becoming extremely simple uh, because of the explosion of open source software put out by uh, Google and Facebook and others. So you have TensorFlow and PyTorch and Keras, which are these incredibly powerful environments where you can design neural network architectures and then train them uh, with, with training data to build these very, very powerful and expressive models. So, so really neat uh, and also increasingly easy to design and use. Okay, thank you.